Hello and welcome to the One About Podcast, a show where three friends get together to talk about a different topic each week. This week we're doing something of a follow-up to our last episode with a movie that hits on topics deeper than anything we've looked at before. This is the one about Rain Over Me. I'm your host, Dean. I also go by Endless Cola in places around the internet, and I am joined this week, as always, by Jordan and John. What's going on this week, guys? Uh, I platinum Demon Souls. I'm, I'm a boss now. I'm the best. So nothing's going Can't on in John's life. That. What about you? <laughs> Got him. A lot of phasmophobia still. And uh, in Rocket League, playing some of that. Um, yeah, same old, same old. Faz is just hitting on all cylinders, man. This this developer's really? pouring his heart and soul in these updates. John, we got to get you in. <sighs> Dude, all I want to do is play more Phasmophobia. I would cancel this motherfucker right now. For more Phasma? Oh, my God. It's really? so fun. It's so it fun. Really I feel like it would like start like you know hitting a wall of possibilities. Yeah, no, it it does, but you but then you you find creative ways around that, and it still it's it still scares the shit out of you. It still can scare the shit out of you. And I I've been in it. Actually, I want to see what my playtime in Faz is. I've been playing Faz for about fifty hours, mm-hmm. and and that's the longest I've ever played a beta game. I think. And it's um, still it's still fresh. And it's and still, fun. Uh, I mean, f- f- fresh is artificially fresh. So like I, we keep it fresh because <laughs> you know good, good good people play it, and we find creative ways to enjoy it. And sometimes we get challenges, right? But it still can scare you. You know, it still makes me jump. Sometimes it gives me that adrenaline, and I love it. And it's also nice to follow the, the developer and their uh, Discord server and see all the changes that, that, they, that he's making every day. I feel like I'm a part of that. I'm a, I feel like I'm a part of that change cycle. I'm actually going to look into submitting uh, bug reports and stuff. I don't play that much to where I can like find major bugs in the, uh, in the betas, but it's working out. Yeah, man. I, I don't know what to tell you. Like there, there's a certain point where you've played every map and you've run into every kind of ghost. There's not really any new content. But because every level, even if it's the same level you've been to before, is randomly generated and such, it still feels super fresh and new every single time. The ghost, oh, okay. the ghost location is random every time. Yeah. 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 The, the, the like, whole level is not randomly generated, but. But like items within it are. So like you, you're not sure where you're going to find the bone and. um Yeah if you'll find the uh the the Ouija board and shit like that and and like he was saying you can give yourself challenges so like oh we're not going to use x and y item or any items at all and you know whatever so yeah um I, yeah. we got to get you into it you'll you'll enjoy it a lot well okay all right absolutely all right. get you into it i'll i'll take a look into it a couple videos here and there see what it's all about and just download it do you it's have a, a do you do you, have, do you have a gaming desktop or just a laptop uh i have both okay well <laughs> oh, the oh, oh jordan was like because uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> baller um the, the only reason i say that is because you're gonna want to sit down at a desk and like lights off like get get that immersion going because that's really where the game get you the know, spook flowing hits its stride absolutely yeah okay all right I'll, I'll get that i'll get that spook flowing see what i can do let me tell you guys a story yesterday uh our friend matt in over in our discord server let me know that there is a local store that sells exotic imported soda pop okay and i was like oh that sounds kind of neat so I got the address and I drove over there and I, I walked in. So first of all, I, I drove past this place like three times because they don't have a typical storefront sign. They have a piece of cardboard in the window that they've wrote on with a Sharpie, the name of the store. That's hot. I like that. Yeah. So, so when I finally realized that, I was like, maybe I shouldn't go in here because I feel like I'm going to get stabbed. But you know what? Fuck it. Go for so the park, gold, man. 
I park and I go inside and inside it's like a 50 by 50 square foot room. And they have like two little stands with some imported snacks and three beverage refrigerators full of these um, quote unquote exotic imported sodas. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at them and I'm like, ah, well, I mean, this is kind of cool. There's nothing in there that I'm like, holy shit, they have Crystal Pepsi from 95 or anything like that. Um, but I was I saw a few things. I was like, oh, OK, that's cool. So I grab up like four or five, maybe six of them. And um, and then I look at one that's still in the fridge and there's a price tag on it. And I was like, oh, let me see what these actually cost before I go up there. It's like fifteen dollars. $20, $25 for a single bottle of pop. I was like, oh no. What? No, no. <laughs> no. And I put them all back except for this one. I'm like, okay, I'll ju- I'll just get this one. And for some reason, it didn't occur to me to look at the price on this one. I was like, ah, it's, it's probably fine. It's fine. it's going to be cheap. I wa- <laughs> I don't know why what the fuck was going through my head. But I get up to the register and he's like, all right, uh, hold on, give me one second here. I'm just uh Okay, uh, so, sorry, first sale of the day, my bad. Uh, okay, okay, okay. He scans these. Uh, $27.85. What? What <laughs> the fuck? So now I'm standing Jesus. here and I'm, at a, and I'm at a crossroads, right? On the one hand, I'm like, there's no fucking way I'm paying almost $30 for one bottle of pop. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But also, I'm going to look real fucking stupid if I say fuck that and put the soda back especially after i saw the prices and already put like four or five of them back in the fridge so this guy already saw me do that he's like this mother this cheap motherfucker over here man. so i'm like okay well i can do that and just be that guy and walk out and never come back and whatever and my brain went nah we're going option two bro insert card so oh, I bought God. the soda. Uh huh. <laughs> so now I'm the proud owner of a Japanese exclusive golden grape Fanta, and mm-hmm. um, it's it's good. It's good. It's 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 good. It's it's, it's very smooth. All that for it's good. It's not, it's not a typical grape flavor. It's it's pretty tasty. It is certainly not twenty five dollars tasty. Not even a fucking close. But it's good, I guess. I had a few sips of it, and I saved the rest for my wife for when she gets back home. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm never going back to that place. Whew. God, that place is fucked, bro. Like it would be, <laughs> it would be one thing if they had a bunch of like regular pop, reasonably priced pop, and then like some exotic, expensive stuff. Right? They don't. They have nothing but exotic, expensive shit. Who the fuck is going to going to track down this place, drive past it like four times before they see a cardboard sign in the window, then go in and spend like $40 for a single bottle of pop? Nobody. It's not a normal human thing to do. This place is screwed. Their business model is trash. Hot garbage, you would say? Hot garbage. They got you. They kind of did. I mean, like, I I struggle to say I made the decision to buy it because, like, my brain just kind of went on autopilot and fucked me out of $30. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, like, I, I did give them money, which is more than I can say for the couple that came in behind me. Um, did they I buy assume a lot or something? I assume they left with nothing. I have no idea. I didn't stick oh, around. Okay. I, I drove away in shame. <laughs> so yeah that's that's uh that's what i've been up to <laughs> well nice, nice. I, I did get the i did get the platinum trophy in shadow of the colossus though after a slog fucking incredible slog dude i would go so Y'all far as to say like trophies if you don't really love shadow of the colossus Going for the platinum in that game kind of ruins it. So sorry. Yeah, because you're the. No, fuck that. 
There's yeah, too I mean, much you, too much replay. You have to if you wanted to play through it the whole way, you have to beat the game, then beat the time trials on normal, then beat the time trials on hard, and then continue to beat the game like four more times. And uh Make sure that at least one of your runs, you don't die. One of the runs has to be on hard and you have to do it in under five hours and 41 Wait, minutes. Wait, you have minutes. to do a run where you don't die? Yes, sir. So if you die, you basically have to just start over, just delete. It's a wash. Correct. Uh, uh, screw that noise. Dude, it's, it's actually not that hard. What, mm. By the time you get through the time trials, you're so unbelievably decked out that the game is a joke. Nah, I don't. No, no, I don't. I don't like it. I don't like it. It's a lie. I'm good. It's a lie. Dude, We're good dude, here, dude. You get an item in the hard time trials that makes you invis- invisible to the colossi. Nope. And one that does maximum damage, so that you can one shot them. It's super duper not hard to get through the game without dying once you get to that point. Nope, you're and a liar. I, and like. Beating the game, the time trials on hard is not that hard either, to be honest with you. Um, the only one that even kind of gave me trouble was um, the Lizard Colossus, that whose name escapes me right now. Um, uh, oh, the um, or something like that. Yes, yes, that was Kuramori. It. That that's actually it. Yeah, yeah, Kuramori. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I didn't know this from my first few playthroughs of the game, but apparently it has a poison attack that it shoots oh, yeah. at you. Yeah. Cause like, well, cause the first few times that I played, played it, I shot it down and stabbed it to death so quickly that it never had a chance to attack me. I didn't even know what attacks it had. Um, but then when I did it on hard, it, I missed one of my arrows. So it did have a chance to attack me. That shit hurts a lot. <laughs> yeah. Even it's with max fun. health, it took away half of my health before I killed it. It's not fun at all. But, yeah. Um, you were saying that one's the easiest one. Is, is it still the easiest one, even on hard? Um, it, well, it depends. So, if... It depends on what items you have at that time. So, like, if you're playing through hard without the time trial items, it's pretty easy but it's not the easiest um if you're playing it through with all items it's unbelievably easy because you can just put on the invisibility cloak and then it can't see you to shoot at you so it can't hurt you just like malice like you just put on the invisibility cloak you run right up to him and he can't even touch you lol so yeah pretty much how easy is it to switch between gear uh, you just open your map, hit triangle, and then select what gear you want to equip. Oh, okay. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Dude, the ability to make yourself invisible to Malice and just walk right up to him, climb to his head, hit him one time, and he's dead? Oh, my God. You want to talk about cathartic. <sighs> so all nice. over all over the place, Dean? It's just all over the place? So nice. Jesus Christ. Did you at least so, yeah. use a towel? <gasps> it's all sticky. <laughs> <laughs> oh mm. my god. Oh no. Oh, Gentlemen! God. Yes, sir. We watched a movie this week. Movie. Or if you're Jordan, you watched a movie today. Um today. Wait, wait, we watched a movie? I- it wasn't it wasn't the anime rain. Wait, I got. Wait one second. Let me just. Wait, I I watched wait. Wolf's Rain. What'd you watch? Oh shit, well, we're in trouble. <laughs> oh god. Released in two thousand and seven, Rain Over Me, starring Adam Sandler and Don Cheadle. Gentlemen, as always, what did you think? Um. I uh I liked it. I thought it was a good movie. Um it definitely flew under my radar. I never knew it would, it existed at all. And I thought Don Cheeto was really good. I thought Adam Sandler was pretty good. What? And 
Um, a lot of surprising like stars. I, I think people just like Adam Sandler in the business because he can always pull these random stars in his movies. I assume this is like his movie, right? Uh, like, is this one of the ones by? that he did, or w- it, did he just like star basically he, he was the driving company? You're basically. Oh, no, I don't think that he did. I think no, this is just what the, oh, he was in. okay. I was about to say, like, do you think he was like one of the driving forces in this movie that like basically put put it all together? Because I don't think he got his production company until a little bit after this point. Because I know what you're talking um, about. Okay. I was I wasn't sure. I think actually but it was a. Anyway, yeah. I thought it was a good movie. It was a, it was better than I thought it was going to be. I don't really care about dramas. I um. You know, whatever, boohoo, right? Oh, Jesus says. Christ! But, uh, wow. Okay. I, I, wa- I watched Lord. this with uh, <laughs> Jordan the Heartless. <laughs> Good Lord! I, I I watched this with my wife, and she actually was. She liked it. Like after it was over, she was like, "I didn't think I was gonna like that, but like that's actually a good movie." I'm like, "Yeah, it's a it's a good movie. It had a, you know, it had a lot of heart to it, and you know, it's kind of deep, and you know, it's." kind of cool but i had no fucking idea why you picked this movie until about 20 minutes into it <laughs> i was like why are we watching this yeah. random ass adam sandler movie kim asked me the same thing and i was like i'm gonna ask him i was like dude, dude he just picked this movie just because <laughs> he was so over the moon for shadows of Coloss- shadow of colossus dude were you just like watching this movie like why the fuck are we watching this right random- what do you mean you killed 12 Colossi? <laughs> Dude, yeah. When he, when, when Don Cheadle's character finally got to him on the street and like, what have you, what have you been up to, man? He's like, Oh, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I just got, just killed 12 Colossus. And I was like, wait, I was like, hold on, red flags. Hold on. <laughs> Flag on the play. And hold I was on. thinking, yeah, I, I was like encroachment. Um, like, why are we talking about Colossus? And then, and then it kind of, the whole Colossus talk kind of goes away a little bit. And then when he brings him up to his apartment and he sits down in front of his TV or his projector and he's fucking playing shadow of the goddamn Colossus. I'm like, what the yep. hell? Definitely on there on like, the, what was it? The it PS2 like, or PS3? PS2. Oh, definitely. With those PS2. graphics, definitely PS2. Well, the PS3 and, version is just a port of the PS2 one, but PS3 yeah. wasn't even out at this point, I don't think. Uh, the PS3 version definitely wasn't out. What are you talking about? This movie okay. came out in 2007. Oh, whoops. I was off by 10 years. <laughs> just a little bit. Um, oh, PS3 Sorry, was um, out at this point, but no, I'm pretty sure it was PS2. Well, I uh, like I exclaimed loudly. Um, like the, uh, like right when he started talking about Shadows of Colossus, I'm like, uh, that's why. And Lauren's like, what? I'm like, I just beat this game. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think of it, John? Um, mm-hmm. I actually really liked it. Um, especially like watching it with Kim. Uh, because I was like, oh, well, what do you want to watch? Well, I gotta watch this. And she's like, oh, okay, you can watch it. I mean, uh, and then like she saw who was in it, and she's like, yeah, I definitely want to watch this. I was like, all right, cool. I've never seen it before. And then who got, I, I who, who got her? Don Cheadle or Jada Pinkett? Uh, Jada Pinkett. Okay. Yeah, because she was like literally was like, oh, Adam Sandler's in this. Oh, Don Cheadle's in. Jada Pinkett's in this. Okay, all right. But um, <laughs> you know, that's a few questions I have for her later. But you know, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but. Uh, I while I was watching it, I remembered bits and pieces of like, oh, I actually have seen this movie, but just not as a whole. Because I remember the really? whole thing about like uh, Don Cheadle and the one patient, and how she was very forward. <laughs> <laughs> she just yeah. had to act on him. Yeah, I remember that part. Um, I do remember the scene where Don Cheadle was like playing in his apartment after he avidly said that he w- didn't have an addictive personality which was hilarious mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but uh and also i remember the scene in the courtroom where he was singing and he got escorted out because of it yeah 
but no, I, I like after watching this movie as a whole, um, it was, it was good. It was really good. It was touching. It was heartwarming. Like one of my favorite scenes was, um, when he finally talked about his family. Yeah. It was, it was really good. So let me tell you guys a story. Back in March of 2007, when this movie came out, I was but an 18-year-old lad and Good Lord. decided that my friends and I were going to go to the theater. And we went to go see a little movie. You may have heard of it called uh, 300. Yes, sir. And, and uh, so we bought our tickets and uh, we're like, okay, we're in auditorium number three that's on your left thank you very much rip my ticket let's get some popcorn i'm gonna get myself some a hot dog today give me a large soda pop it's gonna be fucking great i'm gonna see um leonidas kick this bitch into a pit of death it's gonna be awesome (laughs) we go in and we sit at the very top underneath the projector because that's where i like to sit don't judge me don't at me okay all right cool and i'm i'm eating my popcorn i'm chowing down on this hot dog cheese sauce on the hot dog pro tip and um the movie starts i'm like all right let's get adam sandler what the fuck (laughs) what the guys i think we're in the wrong movie (laughs) and uh we just kind of sat there and watched it anyway and that's that's how i discovered rain (laughs) over me like i had no intention of seeing this film i accidentally went to the wrong theater and just continued to watch it anyway. Nice. Why did you that's, guys stay? I w- that's 100% a John move right there. That's 100% a John move. Why did just, we stay? Because we, we jumped into 300 after that movie. We, we did a double feature. Um, there you go. That's my boy. <laughs> Which, uh, to be honest with you, after watching Rain Over Me, I really needed something like 300 to yeah, perk me back up. Exactly. Yep. So that that's how I found Rain Over Me. I have to say, rewatching it this time, this movie fucked me up, bro. Just, <laughs> I was not emotionally prepared for this movie this time. It it hurt me real deep watching that man grieve over his lost children and wife and stupid poodle. Like, man, it was some. It it was hard. Um, I I. Unlike Jordan over here, which I I have to ask why, thought Adam Sandler's performance was on point the whole way through. I thought he did an incredible job. Um, you know, usually, usually you can get emotional reactions out of me. Like I don't, I don't, I don't shy away. I don't like tote myself as this, you know, stone wall, this emotionless void. But um, <laughs> man, dude, my heart was blacker than star during this movie. Good lord, I just, like, man! I, I, I got it. I knew, I knew the, I knew the impacts of everything. I knew the, you know, that therapist scene and coming out and sitting next to Don Cheadle there, you know, and then having, like, have having him exclaim for the first time in those many years, and like, I knew the impact of all those scenes. But nothing. Honestly, like the, I I think I think that uh, the thing that elicited the biggest emotional response for me was fucking B J Novak's character when he when they were in the courtroom he was pulling out the photos and he just puts the photo underneath Adam Sandler when he walks by him. Oh, that that one that one elicited that one elicited (laughs) anger. And that was it. Cause I'm like, wow, dude, fuck you. Like, that's just like, how big of a piece of shit can you be? You know? Yeah. The rest yeah. of it, that's the all time king dirtbag move, right? Exactly. There. And I like how the judge, bag. the judge wrapped his knuckles multiple times immediately after too, like in their chain, in oh, his yeah. chambers. That dialogue was kind of weird, but I mean, Obviously, uh, I, I don't know the actor's name, but the, the guy that played President Snow in the Hunger Games. Who was oh, yeah. Judge. Dude, tell me he doesn't um, look super awkward without a beard. Or at least uh, a mustache. I thought he looked fine. I, 
No. I, he is such a unique he is such a unique looking person. Yeah. Um like like he's just such a like a statuesque, like chiseled type of face person, right? Um he really stands out, but I can't I don't remember his fucking name. Like but he's an actor that like I should know his name, right? Um Donald probably Sutherland more popular. Is his name. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And I, I hearing it again, it's like, of course, Sutherland. Yes, I knew that. Um but I don't know. I that was like the biggest emotional response for me was was that. And also the the little highs that I would get whenever they would like show a Colossus on screen or show <laughs> Don Cheadle fucking <laughs> Show Don Cheadle fucking up, trying to jump on Avion and jumping in the water. <laughs> <I'm Yeah. noob. laughs> tell me, tell me why did you get? Did you feel kind of a little bit heated, like, or like you just had to point out? It was like they showed the Colossi in the wrong order when it was like doing the little montage of it. Oh my god, yeah, because they showed the second to last Colossus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then they go you know back to the brown me? one. You know what yeah. killed me about that yeah. is like he's <laughs> like. Oh, I've been training in the valley. You know, I've I've taken down twelve colossi, and they go back to his house, and he's on the first one. Like, yeah, lion ass motherfucker. Exactly. He might have he's been doing, doing uh, trials, hard mode. Bro. Yeah, time trials. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he so just he just skipped the last four of them? Come on, no. Nah. I mean, he might have finished him and started time I trials. I guarantee you, know, you don't know that. I guarantee he got to the he got to malice and he's like, wait a minute, this game isn't cathartic. Fuck this. <laughs> this game blows. <laughs> so so let me ask you guys, like, is the symbolism of that whole thing lost on you? Oh, not at all. I think that uh the symbolism is there. It's just not as deep as the actual story of like uh, at a very high level using the story of shadow Col- shadow of the Colossus and using it as, as like a metaphor is appropriate. However, the actual ending of the game, I think isn't in play here. Right. But, yeah. the, but at a very base level, he's trying to resurrect his love, you know, and he has to overcome these 16 Colossus. Um, in whichever way that they represent themselves throughout his life, but if you go any deeper than that, I think the metaphor breaks down a little bit. But that's the, mm, that's not really the point. I would ar- right? I would argue you kind of went too deep already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so like, how exactly. would you interpret like, it? Well, well, what I, I mean, mean that, is that's like as far as you can go. Well, what I mean is like he's he's grieving over the loss of his family in the nine eleven attacks where mm-hmm. they flew a plane into a giant tower. And now he's obsessed with a game where he's toppling tower sized beings over and over again. Mm. It's I, it's I mean, like, I, I think, think that what you said is, is right. But, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying like that yeah. even higher level than that. There's like a metaphor to be had there. Yeah, and honestly, Jordan, I don't think you went far enough because if you think about it, so what uh, the Wanderer is doing in Shadow of the Colossus is he's, again, toppling and killing Colossi in order to resurrect, not touched upon or not really fleshed out, but like his someone he loves. Um, but it ends up... Emily, yeah. yeah, it ends up corrupting him uh and he i don't know if like the infant is him reincarnated or it's just a whole new person so technically i'm going to say that he dies and ends up corrupting him yes their loved one's resurrected but he doesn't see the fruit of his life so he still lost them point blank so it's i I don't know if, if it goes that deep i i mean i think you can make an argument for it but i think that the I think that the writers or whomever's idea this was, they just, they like, they had this game in mind early in the writing process. And I think they just took it at a very like high level. They didn't actually like go through the entire story and everything. I don't well, know the then, whole resurrection, the baby, the baby part of it, Dorman taking over you in the end. Yeah, but no, you know, I think it's people getting sealed. No, I think it's more of a symbolism of him 
just like the wanderer is not dealing with his loss and learning to move forward with his life. Like it's just like Adam Sandler is not dealing with his loss and he's fighting against it, not moving forward with his that. life. That's, that's basically uh, yeah, the yeah, point I, I was trying to make. Yeah. Cause like, I know that's what I mean. He's doing something unnatural to try and cope with it because he can't handle the gravity of that that loss which i again nearly anybody could understand especially like when i heard that he had three children Mm -hmm. and a poodle on the plane along with his wife dude i i don't know if i would be you can't lose more yeah exactly like just burn it all down after that like his entire family gone in a Straight yeah, up, and on top of the most tragic thing you can experience. Yeah, and like they even said, like he lost his parents before then, like to uh, I think it was like an accident or something. Like basically, he had nobody after that. He even like point blank said that to um, his father and mother in law. It's like you guys can grieve because you guys have each other. I don't have anybody. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And I thought I thought the judge was pretty astute. Um and and like his ruling essentially telling them, you know, you have the weekend to to really reconcile with what you want to do with him and to under and to understand him. Because first I, it was never explained why the state being represented by BJ Novak's character really wanted him to be committed for a year. They never really said outside of just, it's their recommendation. It was like their, you know, their uh, um, psychiatric recommendation that he be committed. But like, they were like, why the, he was fighting so hard, you know, like really like it was his first trial. They didn't explain any of that. It's just Mm -hmm. this guy shows up in this fucking courtroom it's a complete douchebag, and then the judge just oh ends up God. leaving it in the hands of a lawyer in diapers, dude. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut yeah, up. I mean, <laughs> my best guess is that <laughs> when you have somebody committed because they try and commit suicide by cop, and then the recommendation at that point is to keep him because he's not stable enough to be released in society in society yeah um you have something of a duty to try and make that happen for the true but for a year though good point that's a really that's a really good point but they never like his character could have said that once or something i totally like i I didn't think i mean that really Th- that's that's true but my thing with this movie is like it implies a lot more than it actually tells you it's it's very much a show not tell type of movie like it took them oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the absolutely. better part of two hours to explicitly tell you what happened to his family they just kind of dance around it for the first and speaking of which like how long did it take you guys to figure out exactly what happened to his family Because, like, the first time they even kind of mention it when um, Alan is talking to his wife, you could theoretically piece it together and figure it out. But, like, maybe not the details, like, that it was actually during the 9-11 attacks and shit like that. Especially now, like, we're, you know, 20 uh, years removed almost. I got it ruined for me from the synopsis. Oh, you read the synopsis first? Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't think mm. that it was like, I, I I didn't know that it was trying to build up to that reveal as something like, as something really deep because it would have been like, if I didn't know that it would have been a really impactful reveal. But I just, the fucking synopsis just said it outright. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, so I didn't get to experience that that release, you know that I, I didn't I didn't experience that along with Don Cheadle's character. I just was waiting for it to come out. Yeah. I wonder if that has something to do with your, um, indifference towards the movie. (laughs) I guess, honestly, if, 
if I can think about it now, and if I can think about what I would have thought without knowing that, so it would have been Don Cheadle being a dentist, being, you know, just unhappy with his life, seeing his friend who looks like a hobo, talking about Colossus, living alone. And Adam Sandler plays him as, at some points, Adam Sandler plays this character as like an emotion, like as a mentally like handicapped person sometimes, like, like kind of like someone that has Asperger's or something. He doesn't play it as, most of the time, he does a relatively good job of playing it as someone who is emotionally damaged, not necessarily like mentally challenged or anything like that. But sometimes he crosses the line to you think that his character has like autism or Asperger's or something like that. So if I didn't know any of this going into it, I think it would have been a very different experience because I wouldn't have known what the fuck was going on. I would have thought that his like maybe his like friend suffered some kind of brain damage or something, and then like you slowly <laughs> learn throughout the movie through other people that he suffered a loss, and then uh, okay, well maybe you know just the 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 PTSD from that experience gave him you know the type of personality that he has today, which is what they were alluding to the whole time. But yeah, I, I was really, I was gonna say I because like they tell you that. So, like, there's that initial conversation at the Johnson family dinner table where they say his daughter asks if Charlie was the one whose family was on the play. To me, like, I knew the plot of the movie already. So, like, I didn't go through that journey this time like John did. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, to me, like watching that scene, because I kind of I, I watch all of our films with a more critical eye than I typically watch films. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the big question for me was like, do they beat around the bush the whole time? Is this supposed to be a big reveal? Like. Kind of how does this, this emotional journey play out? And I was watching that scene and I'm like, OK, so if I'm watching this with fresh eyes, as somebody who doesn't know anything about it. In my head, I'm either going to do one of two things with this scene. I'm either going to write it off entirely because, like, it doesn't mean anything in and of itself. Or I'm immediately going to go, OK, so his family probably died in a plane crash. Um, I don't think at that point you're going to make the connection to 9-11, especially all these years removed from it. Yeah. That we're watching it in now. But, I mean maybe if you had a really close tie to that, you realize that they're in New York City and like it, it's possible, but unlikely. Nevertheless, I feel like I agree. I feel like um, figuring out that they died in a plane crash is probably likely at that point. And that's pretty early on. So I, I don't know all that. All that's a really long winded way of saying that. I don't feel like it's this like big surprise reveal, but I think that that moment in the police station where they just outright tell you that that's what happened is this like like you said it's kind of like something that they were building to the whole time and you get this kind of release from the questions at that point you understand everything everything really comes into focus for you um yeah i missed all that so anyway john i didn't get what what, what was that like for you man it. like cuz you you did come into this fresh right Yes. Well, I mean, technically I watched it here and there, but yes, fresh. And no, I I immediately made that connection when they were talking about that in that scene. Like even Kim like blurted out, I was like, Oh, they died in nine. I was like, Yeah. Like mm -hmm. I I I got it. I I kind of already figured it out when Don Chino mentioned it the first time at dinner with his wife and his daughters. Mm. Like I was like, "Oh. Okay, that's probably what happened, but I don't know. I, I I don't I think of myself as intelligent and I like connect dots and like guess how certain things are put together already as the movie's going forward, so I don't know if that plays into it or not, but to answer your question, I was like, "Yeah, I, I, with fresh eyes, I was like, "Oh yeah, like it was is totally 9/11 like 
that's what it had to be because it's one thing if they died in a plane crash. Yes, they died in a plane crash. That's fine. But for him to get such a huge payout is either the company like it was at fault and he won a class action suit but with his given state i don't think he would have gone after them so he was basically given the mon- money without any real like he didn't go after it himself like they just gave it to him because they like that's how it was supposed to be i believe well and the life insurance policies ah okay cuz did then then they mentioned that he got paid from the government yeah, she his mother-in-law says he get he got some kind of government payout and their life insurance policies. Okay. All right. Yeah. So the combination of those two because you could tell how out of touch he was with the whole situation and just so far removed from even talking about death that when Don Cheadle gets the call after they had the Mel Brookathon which sounds freaking amazing um that i I would love that yeah (laughs) i really would that would be a freaking gem like actually like his movies are some of my favorite movies of all time um but anyways like after he gets out he gets a call his father died um and then he tells adam sandler and he's all like oh you want to go get something to eat there's this place about to open up and it's like He's like, what? No, no, I, my father just died. Like, I don't want to get anything to eat. I, I need to go. And he's like, yeah, 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 I get it. I get it. So you want some Chinese? It's like, he's just so far removed and like, doesn't want to talk about it or address it because of how close it is to his pain and his memory of his family that he lost. That he, he, it, it was, it was huge. And to compound on that, at his father's wake, where they're all gathered together with loved ones, you know, to talk stories about their father, his father, and like how much they loved him and remember him. The guy that's handling his account comes over and tries to ver- verbally ream and accost him, basically saying, I'm here to protect his money. I can't believe he's trying to do this. You're trying to take advantage of him. And he's all like, I just lost my father. You're basically cussing me out while i'm like burying my father this is not an appropriate time what are you even talking about and he's like he wants to give you a million dollars and when i heard that i was like excuse me it's like what it's the type of thing that you imagine oh, like like millionaires doing to people who are think they're lower than them when they like suffer through something like huge it's like oh man you broke your arm I can pay you a million dollars, like, you know, get over it. It's fine. But it's more of he doesn't know any other way how to connect or since he can't deal with his own pain, console him and the loss of his father other than like, I know I acted out of ordinance and really bad when you got that news. And I know what that's like. And I don't know how to deal with it myself, but maybe money will help because that's the only thing I really have to offer. And that that's what I got from that scene, which I thought was handled really well because it shines a light on because they're having a great time. Like Don Cheadle even said is like probably the best time they've had in a long time. He hasn't laughed that hard ever. And then he just gets this terrible news. And then Adam Sandler, who doesn't know how to handle his grief just brushes it aside immediately and doesn't want to talk about it and wants to change the subject yeah, and just keep having totally a good time. Di- totally disassociated with anything like that. Exactly. And he goes to, he goes to extreme lengths to protect himself from even thinking about that or his past at all. Like that, that, um, the brawl in the dentist office, like that escalated oh, quick. Yeah. That was right. That that took me aback, like super off guard, and like he was physically in his face. Like I don't know what I would have done if I was in Don Cheadle's situation. Like I probably would have choked him out and waited till he was unconscious and dragged him uh, out to the street. That, I mean, he would have gotten hit. I mean, yeah. Don Cheadle, he played a cool head there, getting him out of the office or trying to. 
you know. Yeah, and like the fact that he just sat in the lobby room and like he's like, no, you gotta go. I told you to go. Public domain. (laughs) I was like, what do you say? He's like, this this public domain. Like, no, it's not. (laughs) It's not even close to public domain. This is the lobby. Yeah. (laughs) Then he told the secretary to close the door. Hey, tell me why did you guys um catch like the sound that the door close the window closed for the secretary made like that sound is so distinct and i'm actually was really excited that they actually put that sound in the movie because i i remember that sound every mm-hmm. time that i've been to a metal like if you rewatch the movie there is a very specific sound that that type of window makes when it closes fast and it's like at every like doctor's office dentist like whatever that has that type of make of window it makes that very distinct sound and they like i swear like the guys who are doing the soundboard for this movie went out of their way to make sure they got that door that specific door to make that noise i kid you not i don't know why i'm such a nerd about this but like i, I got <laughs> super excited about that I didn't even think about it. It was just like, oh, that's what it, that's what that sounds like. Okay, moving on. No, it's yeah. it's v- very specific. That said, though, can we talk about how awesome his secretary is? Like, <laughs> yeah, Melanie's like the best character in the movie. She kind of gotta is. get out of here. Called you gotta her find back a new dentist. first hussy. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> no one here is gonna. No one here is gonna, is gonna work on your teeth. <laughs> like dude just, that just, was just so messed up off. oh my god he's like he's like no call call her and he's like calling her back from the, like from her desk to the hallway so everyone could hear and pay attention you gotta be bold with these people to make them go away <laughs> yeah. and then lawsuit <laughs> yeah, the threat know, of right? a lawsuit yes mm, mm, the threat was... of a lawsuit and the fact that his partners were just so ready to throw him under the bus, that was oh, messed yeah. up. So well, I, in the beginning I, they were. Well, he had to yeah. he had to basically he came and put his foot down. Yeah, exactly. I basically, put together this practice. Basically called his bitches like some of y'all ain't gonna make the cut. I'm gonna make changes. <laughs> so I wanna ask you guys who your favorite character in this movie is but i think i think i want to approach it a little bit differently so instead of asking you outright who your favorite character is in this movie instead who do you relate to the most in this movie oh god that's super easy that's not even a question it's don Cheadle, isn't um, it John? of course it's don Cheadle. you yes <laughs> Oh shit! I mean, can I relate to Don Cheadle? Yeah, Sorry, there's if, there's if nothing that's what you th- like. It's a personal question. Like you tell me if you relate to Don Cheadle's character. It's, it's totally... I, mean, I don't have a lot of options in this movie, but you kind of. I mean, what are you but, talking about? Yeah. You got Charlie, Alan, Janine, Brian, Donna, Angela, Ginger, Jonathan, Melanie. Adele, <laughs> the, the prosecutor. Nobody wants to be the prosecutor. Nigel. There like, we go. There's a lo- There's like way Nigel. more characters in this movie. Nigel, what the? Yeah, fuck? but they don't. They don't get a. I'm just fucking with you. Yeah, but they don't get a lot of screen time though. So like, it's They're not really fleshed really out. Well, character. I mean, other other than like obviously other than like Nigel or Judge Reigns or something like. That. All those characters that I listed have more than enough screen time where you can kind of get a gist of who they are. It's it's not like a deep, comprehensive, I'm literally Alan Johnson's character. It's just like, who do you relate to the most? And why? Well, while Jordan's thinking about that, John, why, why are you Alan Johnson in this movie? Uh, I'm Don Cheadle because of... Basically, like, I see myself in him, like, doing the day-to-day routine. It's just, like, he goes to work, 
although I have a job that I, I love doing and the work that I do there, like, yeah, there's minor annoyances and stuff like that, but that's with every job, but he goes to a job that he hates, doesn't like all that much. All he does it just because it pays really well. And then he comes home and he just spends time with his significant other, which again, is not a bad thing, but when you don't have enough time to breathe or to be yourself or just enjoy something for yourself, not for anybody else, it can weigh down from time to time. And I get that feeling, but mostly that feeling comes from you not communicating with your partner. That feeling of i don't know semi loneliness slash uh, a need for basically a me day like when you don't communicate that you are at fault more than anybody else because you're not telling people what you need in actually to to be happy to be you and i think that's what his impromptu psychology psychiatry sessions outside of the the lobby were about because she's saying she hit the nail on the head is like you're not being very communicative you need someone to talk to to get this off your chest because she could tell that if he can't even open up to someone he's supposed to talk to someone that you pay to talk to to talk about your feelings how do you think he's like even opening up to the people that are closest to him about what he's actually feeling and thinking to get that off of his chest to actually flesh out his emotions in a way that people can react to them and either help him or put him on a path to where he can do what he wants to be happy. Like if you don't take that first step, nobody else is going to. And if they do, like, will you be open to it if you're not willing to talk? It's like, I relate to that because before I met Kim, I was actually in that mode. And in a lot of my relationships, I basically did what I thought was right and what I was supposed to do and make everyone else happy, but I never really worried about my happiness or thought about my happiness as even a second or third priority. But that's why I relate to Don Cheadle. I know what that's like. I know what that can turn into. And at the end of the movie, when he actually starts opening up, because I think him helping Adam Sandler's character fight through his grief let him know like how talking just how talking about something that's on your mind is such a huge relief and can do such a benefit to your mental health and he actually like started talking to his wife and like she broke down and straight up was like i know i don't tell you enough that i love you but i just want you to come home and bring the kids and all he had to do was admit that he's not opening up like she expected him to, especially being married for that long. I'm deeply moved. Yeah. Really good analysis. Um, I guess if I had to pick someone that I was emblematic of, Maybe Angela, the psychiatrist, tries to be a consummate professional. Um, (laughs) Tries. Um, You can tell that she does. You can tell that she does deeply care about you know her patients, specifically um, Charlie and uh, Alan in this movie. You know she's she's there at the state fighting against the. um, the the state uh, s- uh, psychiatrists saying she can treat them, let him grieve in his own way. She was there in the courtroom 
She was there outside of the courtroom. You know, she was, um, you know, she, she, she was there every week with him. She was being patient with him. So yeah. I, I think I see a little bit of myself in that, right? Like I would want to try to help as much as possible and, you know, kind of walk with them through that journey and make sure that they're okay. I think I can, I think I can see a little bit of myself there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, she was a super patient and really understanding oh, psychiatrist, yeah. even though like everybody's like, how old are you? <laughs> You're way too young to be in this profession or even talk yeah, about and what people are dealing with. I'm a, I'm a very patient person until I'm not like, I know my <laughs> thresholds like, like with, with my wife, unlimited patience, unlimited <laughs> with, yeah, with rocket league. I got about two seconds <laughs> and then there's a hard you, stop. You miss one challenge and it's like, it's over. You break the controller opponent misses one open net it's done i'm 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 over it <laughs> i mean the fact that um she knew that he had to he had to open up in his own time to where he like literally asked was like are we done with the session and she was like if you want it to be and she's like yeah and i was like that's that's pretty huge. I'm pretty sure she only billed him for like the time that he sat on the couch. If that. Cause um, yeah, yeah. I don't think she was in it for the money. I think she's just generally there to help people. And you could you could tell that from the way that she just mm-hmm. interacted with everyone that she talked to. Like even Don Cheadle's care like even Don Cheadle's character, like she outright told him it was like she gave him like probably like uh 15 sessions worth of advice in a sentence is like you're not being communicative you need to talk to someone that's basically what it was and after he talked to adam sandler like at to charlie and like saw like how good it was for him and he talked to him like that one night of them drinking just one night of them drinking and him like airing out his concerns he was a new man straight up new man and that's huge and she all she all she did was just say like you just need to talk to someone dean it it's hard for me to pick just one because i can really relate to where charlie is in this movie i've been in that dark place after losing loved ones before um thankfully i never had to deal with losing my entire family in one fell swoop but um you know like i lost both of my parents my grandparents are gone like i i've i've had enough loss for one lifetime but If I had to say that I relate to anybody, I got to go with the prosecutor, man. Fuck Charlie. He's just like he he's a danger to everybody around him. And we got to put his ass back in the mental institution. All right. So good night, everybody. Um, (laughs) Great podcast. (laughs) Fleshed out my demons. I feel really good. He's Put that picture right in front of, of this of fucked up photo. man and get him off here. Jesus Christ. Staple that shit to every wall on his cell so that he can never not every. look at it again. What the fuck? Every man? square inch on the Damn. ceiling, on the floor, on Just every wall, him. on down the hallways. Jesus. Put him in a padded room. And Just, Just that's some chaotic get evil speci- shit right there. Specially printed pills with that photo on them. So <laughs> Good lord. He just can't escape. Now it's inside him. No, no, no. Um, I would say that I probably relate the most to Janine. Uh, Jada Pinkett Smith's character. Yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. Because, well, for one, Sean's my soulmate. Can't live without him. Good just come lord. home, baby. You're going to you're going to take this out, right? 
<laughs> no. No. I'm Damn not. it. Oh god, I hope Kim doesn't listen to this. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna link it to her directly with the timestamp. Uh, <laughs> let's see. One hour and ten minutes and five seconds. <laughs> That's my man. <laughs> no, I, I just I can really relate to the the kind of adulting that she tries to keep going around the house, the sense of normalcy and routine, especially as a stay at home father, like routine is everything when you have a small child. Um, And that, that feeling of just being upset when things are out of your control and don't go the way that they should or that you need them to for that normalcy to be maintained and like just being a spouse you know like just generally being a spouse um yeah i just i just really relate to that um i think that hits home in a way that is just really raw and real and she she kind of comes off in this film as the the naggy kind of bitchy wife that's at home right Mm -hmm. like really you don't see much of her outside of her giving alan shit because he's trying to help charlie and you're always hanging out with charlie and you didn't answer my phone calls and you stayed out all night i can't believe but when you have this understanding of where she's coming from like that that makes sense because it's not it's not like this character exists in a vacuum right like they've been married for a number of years they have children together like this is the the status quo so for him to just change everything on a whim because he happened to run into charlie again all these years later it's not fair to her it's not fair to the kids it's not fair to alan himself like he's fucking up everything because he has this sense of need to help his friend who's lost in a, in the world. And like, there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to have adult priorities for your own life at the same time. And yeah. that balance is often very difficult to maintain uh, doubly. So if you you're in a situation like this, where like you, you feel like you need to give everything to this other person who's crying out for help and lashing out to, to not, have to face their problems to not cope yeah but even when you feel that sometimes as an adult you have to look at it rationally and just be like is this really the best course of action for not only charlie but for me and my family and being able to do that and make those decisions that's that's really what divides the boys from the men in in our real society and i don't know i i just i i thought that really hit home for me yeah i can understand that i totally get that oh absolutely yeah it's hard to maintain that balance it's hard to maintain that structure yeah incredibly I've difficult. Had make... i have no consistency in my life whatsoever <laughs> yeah no i can't even get you to play phasmophobia two nights a week it's fucking crazy man so is so is well we have a new release today well something came up well well it's like jordan's Uh, catchphrase well Well. (laughs) actually dude i get that shit from my mom because um my cousin makes fun of me for the same shit too he's like he's like your catchphrase is either well or um Oh my god! What else does he fucking make fun of? Um, it's either well, I know, or I say I know. <laughs> yeah, those Jordan. I, I say I know a lot. I mean, I say I know a lot, and then I also say we'll see. Yeah. So oh I say, yeah, we'll that is see a good Jordan. A fucking all the time because my mom used to do that to me all the fucking time. Was like, hey mom, can we get you know uh, hungry Howie Wacky Wednesday two pizzas for five ninety nine. And she's like, we'll see. And then I'm fucking eating peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> we have hungry we'll Howie's see. at home. Hungry Howie's at home. Yeah. <laughs> just, just loose cheese on dry bread. 
Yeah, like for me, a, a, a we'll see is generally a no. So now, now when I type that to Ronnie, he's like, "Oh, it's a fucking no." Then he's like, "All right, <laughs> like, sorry." I'm just you know, because sometimes ninety five percent of the time it's a no, but there are some five percent of the times where things work out surprisingly all in my favor. I hit all green lights or whatever, um, and we're we're G two G, you know, and I. Hey, I didn't lie, right? If I say no, I'm lying. If I say we'll see, I'm not lying. <laughs> Let me ask you guys a question. Yeah. When they hit that scene and um when when Alan comes over to see Charlie after that first time he goes up to his apartment and the two characters who we later find out are his in-laws start coming up and he he rushes Alan onto the the motor scooter and rushes away. Who did you imagine that they were? My wife called them immediately. Like she was like, "Oh, I bet that's his in-laws." And I'm like, "Oh, I I bet you're right." Mm. Like immediately I kind of like just understood it was them. Yeah, I kind of had the same thought just for I was like, "Who would be visiting him?" Because oh, the IRS run. No, because <laughs> if it was his parents, it would have been it would have been like different. But if it was his in-laws, I would understand because his in-laws would want to only talk about his now deceased wife and daughters. And he doesn't want to deal with that. Like his parents, he might tolerate them because like they're his parents and he already grew up with them so he has some sort of like childish obligation to them even if he is grieving and like his parents might not want to just totally shove the fact down like your wife and your daughters are dead and we need to talk about them but his in-laws that's going to be basically their only purpose they want someone else to grieve with them so that's the only thing that's going to be on their mind. Which, um, another thing that that brings up is like, what does he keep, who does he keep referring to as them? Is he just referring to his in-laws or is there someone else who wants him to like grieve and actually cope with his loss? I think... I read that as others, may, possibly his in-laws or others, maybe friends or something, have tried to give him help before because he has this like irrational fear or hatred mm-hmm. of like psychiatrists or therapists. So, oh my God. I, yeah. I read that as a, or I took it as him generalizing like the like the therapist or psychiatric community, like, oh, you're one of them. You know, what are you trying to do? Like he he mentioned certain tactics. He's like, he's like, oh, are you trying to condition me or something? Like he, he mentioned something in the doctor's office. Like, why would you bring that up? Because obviously you trying to focus other me? therapists. Oh, there yeah. you go. The focus you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he's obviously been through a, unsuccessful therapy sessions or he's talked to um psychiatrists or or you know, counselors that couldn't get through to him, and he knows the tricks by now. And he knows yeah. the, he he knows the the tells he knows how they lead conversation or how they implant things. So he's super on edge whenever he thinks that Alan is trying to set him up or to talk about something specific. And he fucking flies off the handle. He calls he really out that does. fucking he calls out that fucking dork Nigel right away. Dude. <laughs> oh he had him pinned. I made you he in a second. He had his ass pinned right away. <laughs> no, outside. Was... Let's go outside right now. I'm going to beat your ass. Oh, my God. Bob you Seger your fans se- will beat you up. No. <laughs> yeah, you'd get fucked up at a Bob my, yeah. <laughs> my fucking no, hilarious. Dude. My favorite line was like, you order salad like a psychiatrist. You got psychiatrist hands. I was like, what does oh that even god, mean? Oh, my God. I loved that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, 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 wait. Oh what are God. psychiatrist hands like? <laughs> yeah. And he wasn't, I don't yeah. even think he was trying to like, like even like delve into like what that would mean to his psychosis or anything like that. I think he was just actually curious. Was like, what does that even mean? 
like genuinely wanted to know the answer. Oh, and to your um other comment, Jordan, what uh Don Cheadle said, or I think his his character's name is Alan, right? Yeah, Alan Johnson. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Alan. Alan Johnson. I'm gonna call him AJ. Nope, not calling him AJ. Calling him Alan Johnson. Um, Alan Johnson's character. What he said was, "When's the last time that you've been at a dentist office, Charlie?" And that's when he flew off the handle. Because that's the type of question that people who are wondering how he's doing, how he's grieving, or like want him to start like you know having a natural daily routine to actually get back to some semblance of life after his loss that's a a question that they ask all the time because he was a dentist and like when people are like what are you even doing when's the last time that you've been in a dentist office like that's a question that they always ask in every movie that anybody is like grieving or not dealing with their trauma well, like even if they're like, you know, totally into like a manic episode to where they're like doing all sorts of drugs, going out to clubs and like sleeping with random people, they'll literally, that question always comes up. When does the last time that you've done such and such, you know, what they used to do um, in their normal routine, in their normal lives? Like he went to school for this and like now he's not even going close to a dentist's office or practicing anymore. He. Yeah, like he was a full dentist. He had his own, maybe not his own practice, but he was a practicing dentist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he spent two years butt naked harassing Alan to get back. Oh my God. When he was talking to to the freaking secretary, he was like, I'm here for uh, Alan Johnson, to his uh, Charlie. He's like, what? Who are you? I was like, oh, I was his college roommate. Slept naked. It was like, he didn't even break the sentence up. He's like, I was his college roommate. I slept naked. He was, he was like, good for you. Closed the window. <laughs> I love the second time he comes back, she just closes it immediately. <laughs> Dude, the not best, dealing with it. The fucking best scene with Melanie, though, is after Charlie throws the fit in the the doctor's office starts wrecking everything. She's like, no, this is not okay. Melanie, shut the door. You can see her behind the glass with her arms yep. folded all pissed off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Opens it up when uh, um, when Donna shows up. The doctor will be right with you. Slams his shit shut again. <laughs> oh, my God. That was freaking hilarious. And then he just totally changed the subject. He's like, wait, that's the girl? That's the chick you were talking about? Oh, she's incredibly hot. It's so it's crazy. Oh, like, he, was so, <laughs> he was so he was so enamored with her and I couldn't get I, I think I briefly remember seeing a picture of his wife, but I think his wife actually looked like her, right? A little bit. She wasn't as skinny I thought as she her. did. But her her facial features were similar to his wife's, yes. I wasn't sure if that's what they were trying to insinuate, like, oh, he found someone he was interested in and it looks like his wife. Like, oh, I wasn't sure if that's where they were going with that. Mm, no, I don't think they were just alluding two to that. Brunettes. <laughs> no, it was just like it was an attractive woman and he really doesn't get out that much and then just to see I mean, I someone thought, who's above average attractive by conventional I thought standards. She was good looking, but I mean, I thought she yeah. was good looking, but I mean, he was really putting it on for her, like really gushing. Oh, yeah. I'm like, uh And then when he was talking uh, about like, the psychiatrist. <laughs> oh my god, you're you you have nice brown soft boobs or something like that or i'm like oh god this is awkward as fuck. oh okay. the best part no the can best be part over? is this the can subsequent this be, yeah i was I, I was telling the movie that can this be over <laughs> the best part was a subsequent visits with a psychiatrist she was wearing a very thick turtleneck sweater after that oh my god i didn't even pick up on that really dude it was dark green like there's no way that you couldn't pick up on that like after he said that, wow, first of all, just, she like he just said he didn't. Jesus Christ, <laughs> calm down. But after he God, said that initially, 
he she like basically like did a weird movement where she like tried to put her hands up but there was nothing to rest her hands at that level so she just had her hands mid-air like trying to cover her boobs I've never been told that about my boobs, so I don't know how it feels. Uh, I've been told mine are very uh, firm, yet jiggly in some areas. Firm yet jiggly. I can confirm this fact. You heard it here, folks. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) God, no. Please, please, Kim, don't I can also confirm that John is a very gentle cuddler in bed. Oh god damn it. All right. So, good night, guys. <laughs> oh, little spoons. God damn it. He he likes to be the little spoon, actually. It's kind, Dean, of, kind of adorable for such a large man. I swear spoon. you're going to have my relationship in jeopardy after this. Can we just talk about how they got the name of Shadow of the Colossus wrong every single time it's mentioned in this movie? Yes, they definitely did. It, it seemed fucking intentional. I, I thought they were just kind of abbreviate. Like I, 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 I picked up on it, but I thought that they were just abbreviating it, or or like just no. by making it, it longer. Not. Like <laughs> they were not. I, I, I don't know because like. We talk about Shadow exactly how I just did, uh, the completely unintentionally. We'll, we'll call it Shadow, or we'll call it uh, SOC if we're just like in in text or something. Um, but they were calling it all kinds of weird shit. And I thought they were just abbreviating, or they were just like just saying it casually. So I think there's one of two ways to look at it. Either they did it on purpose. Because, you know, people screw things up like that up all the time. Like um, people call subway subways all the time. Right. Or. They just screwed it up over and over and over again. They just let it ride. Like Don Cheadle is like, for some reason, I'm just not going to get this right in this script. And nobody was like, you know what? We should really make a point of fixing that. And Who cares? It's just a video game. Nobody cares. I mean, it felt organic. It felt it felt in 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 some way intentional. That's all I can really say. It felt intentional. <laughs> I don't know. I think it bugs me in particular because, like, I notice things like that. I pick up on them all the time, and it bugs the shit out of me. Yeah, I I kind of got it too. I'm just like, uh, is that uh, there's no. Like for someone who's using this as a device to escape coping with such a heavy loss, for him to like get the name wrong every single time hurts my soul. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my god. Eh. Oh. Actually, one of one of my favorite characters, but not from this movie, but plays one in something that we've talked about before. I'm just going to going to throw this here and see if you guys can guess what I'm talking about. Uh, all right. Hercules. Or not Hercules. Not Xena. He was a uh, joxer. One of the Yep, one of the very few characters to be in both Hercules and Xena because he is Ted Raimi, San Raimi's brother. Um, And Joxer was one of my favorite characters, especially since they literally made his own song (laughs) called The Ballad of Joxer the Mighty. Well, as is tradition, all talk of Hercules will be cut from this episode. So, God God damn it. I need a disappointed. So <laughs> Thank you, Jordan. Because I would love to have screamed that right now, but I am downstairs and I don't want to wake up the child. So one other thing that I wanted to point out, because I feel like as three married men, I'm, I'm going to count you to John, even though you're not technically, but you will be soon. You'll join the rest of us soon. Yeah. 
Um, I feel like we can all relate to that one scene where Charlie comes over to Alan's. Oh apartment my god! Yeah, I know he's exactly like, what you're doing. He's like, don't ask my wife if I can go out. And then he like side eyes her, like, can, can I go out? <laughs> she gives him this fucking look, like, yeah, you better fucking ask me, you bitch. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> Though the best part is I was watching it with Kim and we just both are rolling laughing. I was like, that is legit how that shit would play out <laughs> every fucking time. That's that's exactly but, what happened to me too. Lauren and I were <laughs> really laughing. Like straight up. Because usually I, like, I'm like usually, you know, she just plans my itinerary. Like <laughs> like I have like I have a say in like you know, de- democratically on things that we do, but like mm-hmm. she, like the schedule is hers. Like, yeah. Like if you have a free that? day, if you have a free day and she knows it, you like sit there and think you're going to do something. And then you have a whole itinerary that you didn't even know needed to be done. You know exactly what you're talking like, about. I remember, I remember I took a vacation to play. I took a vacation to play cyberpunk and I ended up not playing cyberpunk the entire time. I played other games (laughs) and um, actually before that I, I I played ghost of Tsushima for like 12 hours straight one day. And she's like, all you've done is play video games today. And I'm like, yeah, it's been one of the best days I've had in months. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, this is like, I'm like, I've definitely never had is... that conversation before. <laughs> oh God. I had that so many times. It's just I'm like, like playing this is Souls. like, right? this brings me back to being like a teenager and doing this shit all the time. You know, what like, is like, responsibility? That makes me happy. Yeah. And, and then own. like, she gets up in the, like, she'll get annoyed because she's bored. Yeah. And then, yep. like, and then I have to stop what I'm doing. Because mm-hmm. she wants to do something with me, I'm like, no, yes, yes. Like, no, like get on, That's get it. on your phone. Or the power of being married, like, one thousand percent that, one thousand percent that. I I win those like one out of fifty times, maybe. Well, usually it's like rate, if I'm dude. getting into this. Sw- like, you win uh, those. Usually it's like if, if I'm getting in, right? If I'm getting into the swing of something, or if, if I'm really like you know playing playing games or getting into something that i want to do that usually just gets derailed or something like because i can just go all you know all day long but she's like oh you know there's not really a lot of food in here and then she'll th- that's all she'll say and then i'll i'll hear it and i'll acknowledge it and I'll, I'll keep playing video games she's like i'm not sure what we're gonna eat for dinner tonight she's like i guess i can try and cook this and i'm sitting there and i know where this is going and i'm playing video games i'm like I keep playing just just keep playing. Just keep playing. <laughs> Maybe it'll stop. And then eventually, she, and then eventually, she's like, "I think we need to go to Publix." And I'm like, "No!" <laughs> and then, <clears throat> and then a shopping trip turns into three hours because we're not only are we going shopping, but we're going to other stores and we're doing other things. And and then if I'm doing that, I got to clean the fridge out. And then if I clean the fridge out, I'm taking the trash out, and that's going to be a whole thing. I'm taking the whole litter out now, and now I'm vacuuming because I'm doing this. Like it's just a waterfall. It just shit rolls downhill after one of those triggers just gets let loose. And then I'm like a day that I thought I would spend eight hours playing video games and enjoying my, my time off turns into an hour playing video games and six hours of chores. Yeah. That sounds but, about right. Yep. That's 100% uh, you know, right. Adult, mm. you know, that's how, Adulting. It, how it works. It's so hard. That's why uh usually what I do is like if I have free time, it's just like you're literally sitting there and thinking is like what would make her angry if I didn't get it done right now? <laughs> <laughs> and whatever you you're, you're, forgot you're like, is what's gonna be the topic. It literally oh, is yeah. every like, time. There's always something you, you forgot because it's literally a non issue until it she needs it to become an issue. But Jordan, let me tell you, this is the secret, man. What you do is uh, you grow a pair and you put your foot down. You say, no, today's my day. I'm playing video games. <laughs> and you grab up your blanket and your pillow because you're sleeping on the couch now. <laughs> but then you keep mm-hmm. playing. 
That's a fucking death sentence. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely how that works. Yeah. Straight or alternatively, up. you can be a real man and really put your foot down. Absolutely don't concede at all. And then when you finish the game, just pack up your shit because you no longer live there. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. Ladies and I gentlemen of the jury. What? So, I, well, I was just going to say, like, some days, like, if I really make a case, like, if I know that I want to spend like all day Saturday playing video games, nothing else. Like I will plant that seed five to seven days in advance. And mm -hmm. I will like every day I'll be like, man, I did, uh, t t work sucked today. I did so much. I got to work late. And then the whole week it's like, I'm just back to back doing shit. And then so when Saturday hits, she's like, you know what, honey, you had a long week. You know, I'm going to, you know, just, just relax. You know, I'll do the, I'll do, I'll do the laundry right now and you know and then the dishes don't worry about it you can just hang out and then that that all day of video games like it still turns into like maybe 4 hours or 6 hours max but I get more than average That's Stunks. That's a lie <laughs> <laughs> I Finally got short Oh Fuck shit, shit. No, actually, one of my most annoying qualities to Kim, I know, very few, um, but um, I can be doing something totally different. Like, I will be playing a video game, watching a movie, coding, whatever. She'll talk to me and then stop talking because she thinks I'm not listening. And I literally, like, look up and I was like, no, keep talking. She's like, you're not even listening. And I repeat everything she said verbatim up until that point. She's like, I fucking hate you. It was like, you hate having a significant other who actually listens to every word that you're saying. <laughs> She's like, fuck you. It's like, all right, cool. Yeah, but you know, you're a piece of shit for that. Kind of. But it's just Dude, like, I want, I, I want her. In, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, got him. That's yeah. <laughs> I don't have that experience. Like, I've had that ability for a long right, time. Can we, can we cut this tangent off at the pass at this point, gentlemen? Fine, fine. Like, Jesus okay. Christ. It's... What I about mean, wives? We, we should, actually, we should have a podcast where we have all of our significant others on at one time. Oh, <gasps> for va for Valentine's Day! This sounds like a no. horrific idea. <laughs> no. Why do you want to get kicked in the nuts for two hours? <laughs> no, my daughter does that. I, mean, I, guess that's fair. I think she ruptured one of my testicles. Anyway. <laughs> am I crazy? Or is Sugarman the most sympathetic character in this whole movie? He makes he makes the hardest point when Alan goes to visit him in his office. Oh yeah. Uh, he like really just digs in and it, and like he's like I was his best friend I knew their family he's like mm -hmm. you know on September 12th I didn't exist yep and he's he's totally right like he after all these years he has found the best way to help and protect Charlie throughout all of this which is you know, watching his back like he did when he found out that he was going to, you know, give Alan a million dollars. He quickly went, you know, during the wake of his father and mm -hmm. said, you ain't getting that fucking money. Like, that's a that's a pretty bold thing for a for just a, an accountant to do. They don't, tr you know, usually do that kind of stuff. And at that point, you didn't know he was a friend. You saw he was some kind of rampant accountant. But when they have that dialogue in his office, it really puts to light like wow like the i think along the lines of what he says or the point of what he said was he finally found a friend that he connects with which isn't going to remind him or bring up anything about his wife or his family and yeah, that's why he's connecting he with him. him and the irony yeah. Because he never met him, and the irony of the situation is that that person 
who he can connect with is the one that is trying to bring all that back into his life. Mm -hmm. And that hit hard. I'm like, Oh my God, what an incredible point. Like he's really, you can tell that this was, this was a character that was written to express a friend who has been here for years and years and years. And just has reconciled with the only thing that he can do and what his, what his role in his friend's life has to ultimately be because he has no other, no other options. I thought that was really, really intelligent. And I actually really liked uh, Sugarman's character. Yeah. Also, um, how did you feel about Jada Pinkett basically calling out mm, Alan on saying the reason that he's doing this isn't because he actually cares for him. It's because he's jealous of Charlie because he's free. Unlike Alan, who has so much responsibility that that he feels is suffocating him. You know, what's interesting about that scene. They're both right. Mm -hmm. Like Jada Pinkett Smith's character is clearly and obviously jealous of Alan and his new friend in Charlie and the amount of time that he spends away from the family and all that. But also he covets what Charlie has and wants to be free from what he perceives as his life's trappings. And they're both too stuck in their own perspective to see that they're both right and wrong at the same time. Yeah. That's a good I point. Thought that was... Yeah, I think I can definitely find uh, validity in both of their, you know, both of their arguments. Yeah, they're, they're it was. Just, it's kind of petty, right? Both of them, and I thought it was. It's funny that Alan, you know, his wife was getting the last word in, but he had to just come back in that room and oh say, don't God, don't do was, that. You know, I, I so see because you want me to go, and then you're gonna mm. <laughs> say hi yep, to Charlie for me. That's marriage. Yes, yeah, marriage yeah. right there. That legit was like I could totally relate to that shit, one hundred percent. Because I'd be that petty motherfucker. Like if I was in an argument like that, I'd I would literally like, don't you fuck with my head like that? Don't you don't don't talk to me like that? I don't care if you're right. I'm leaving. Don't say shit. But <laughs> you know what? I would be like, you know what? I'm going to Charlie's now on purpose. So there. <laughs> How you that like them apples? Of- I'm going to wake his ass up. (laughs) That wasn't part of my original plan, but I'm going to do it now just to prove you wrong. (laughs) And I won't tell him hello for you, bitch. (laughs) You'd only say that in your head, though. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You you never let that one slip out. (laughs) You're not a psychopath. (laughs) Yeah, you don't get to come back to the house after that one. Oh, my God. (laughs) The closest I get to that word is heffa. That's the closest I get to that word. See, I, I'm too white to drop a heifer on it. Like I can. Like I, yeah. Oh, I'm, it was I'm, so I'm frequent at one right time. Now. It was so frequent at one time. She thought our daughter's first words were going to be heifer, uh, which I totally agreed with. I would have loved that. It would have been great, actually. That would have been the best story to tell at campfires and your child as they were growing up. Your first word was heifer. You was born with sass. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. We are at the moment you've all been waiting for. What's in Jordan's notes? Joxer the mighty, he's very tidy. We're cutting this out of the podcast. God damn it. I, uh... I didn't take notes. <laughs> I was in such a rush and I couldn't get my one note working on my phone. And I just, I didn't feel like I was eating while watching the movie and I didn't want to stop eating because I just didn't want to stop eating. Cause I can't help myself. And I couldn't take notes while doing that. And I didn't take notes and I, I didn't feel like I needed to take notes for this movie. There are probably small little things that I could have captured in my notes, but I got the gist of it. I know the impact. I know the characters. I just watched it a few hours ago. It was a good movie. It was a good movie. Um, 
you can read this can I audience as Jordan didn't give a fuck because there's no action in this movie. No, it was because no, Jordan I... is a heartless monster and he felt he didn't need to take notes about something hey. that was so soulless. That sounds about right. <laughs> I Maybe it was just I was soulless at the time, so I couldn't find it in my heart to to write anything down. But I have shown emotion on this podcast with, you know, Lost at Sea and even um even um oh my god um uh, uh, don't phasmophobia me <laughs> uh, I, I um I, is it I kill giants it's I kill giants I kill or giant. I slay giants oh so all we gotta do is make Jordan read a comic great next week is gonna be an awesome show Com- yeah nice. no I I did a <laughs> I, I did mention that uh, when we did our um, I Kill Giants podcast episode that for some reason comics can really elicit an emotional response from me. But I am not a, a, a soulless monster, even though one of my favorite movies is now Thanks Killing. I still have some heart left in me. Uh, by the way, before I forget, um, I just want to make a note to both of you gentlemen that next week's comic is quite a bit longer than the past two that we've read so don't neglect it to the last minute um gentlemen do you have anything else that you would like to notate before we wrap up for this week um i resonated with a lot of characters in the movie on different points but like i never resonated with a character so much in this point in my life more than Alan Johnson in this movie, and I didn't realize it until you asked me that question. But it was it was a really good watch, super good watch. Enjoyed it, even though it like hit me in the feels. But um, Adam Sandler needs to get more credit for his acting capabilities, in my opinion. Didn't he get enough of that with uh, Uncut Gems? He, you know how much longer that took. Yeah, bro, that was like. like... 14 years later exactly and like uh, and like even after this movie people were like eight crazy "Eh." nights no eight crazy nights is one of my (laughs) favorite animated christmas movies and i have that on dvd when it first came out are you a fan of adam sandler john um i am i do like adam sandler when it comes to comedy like he actually I myself did underestimate his acting capabilities until I saw a few of his movies like this one, Uncut Gems, and there were other ones, but um, he's wholly underrated, in my opinion. He's not a one-note actor that some people make him out to be or think that he is. Um, But for definitely comedy movies, he's definitely within top five. Anyway, you were going to say, Jordan, before I accidentally cut you off. I want to add on that. Click. Click is a great movie. Great movie. Yeah. Fantastic movies. <laughs> um, there, there was one thing that we didn't talk about. Okay. The Captain America comic. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Where uh, Don Cheadle, like, says, like, yeah, oh, was, Captain America has a side... Yeah, has a partner yeah. and he's black and he's the Falcon. Yeah, I think that, that Dude, you just want to bring know. attention to that. Like, when did Iron Man come out? Two thousand eight. The movie. Yeah. Two thousand eight sounds right. Two thousand and eight. Yeah. You think that was kind of a nod to Don Cheadle knowing he was going to get that role? Not he obviously no, he's not because... he's not the Falcon, but but like a a Marvel role, like him saying I'm going to be War Machine is a little on the nose. Actually, no, actually, never mind. Then he wasn't, he wasn't it, even um, in there until the second it one. It was Terrence Howard. It wasn't even him. Original movie. Yeah. yeah, you're you're right. It, it was Terrence. You're right. It wasn't even Don Cheadle right uh, right well, away. Well, that's because Which, Terrence. Why would they replace? Yeah, why'd they replace him? Because Terrence Howard was asking for too much money. He was asking for more money than the headliner, Robert Downey Jr. Weird. And 
no offense like actually i'm gonna say this right now like you can cut this out i don't care ving rain should have been war machine um in the mcu he has been the perfect person to do it in my opinion it has the swagger the attitude and the demeanor to play the who? perfect war machine in my opinion ving rames the guy who looks like my dad if he was bald um but terrence howard com- like between terrence howard and don Cheadle, don Cheadle's better in my opinion i thought to play someone don who's Cheadle military was a, was a surprising Don Cheadle was a surprising choice because of his age. Ving Rhames would have also been a surprising choice because of his age, too. Um, a fun Fish. choice. I think Ving Rhames is an incredible actor. Um, but it, it, it would, seeing Don Cheadle was, was awkward because he just, he just looked kind of older than I thought a war machine would look like. But I, I, I don't really know too much about the character, so maybe that's kind of you know appropriate. But I don't, you know, it, 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 it always just kind of felt weird. Yeah, I think like playing a military person, but like, but like a badass military person, Ving Rhames would have ate that role up. That's how I see it. Jordan, do you have yeah. any final thoughts before we wrap up for this week? No, um, the movie surprised me. Um, didn't blow me away, but it definitely surprised me. I like the Shadow of Colossus um, theme and theming around the film itself. I like seeing uh, Don Cheadle's character, Alan, totally fuck up getting on a- um, Avion like I did and jumping into the water and not the wing. <laughs> that was the to see. Uh, they didn't show Malice. Um, I thought it would have been super funny if they had like some nerd that was writing that's like, okay, late in the movie. No, no, no. The, the last scene where where um, he's sitting on his in his new apartment where Charlie's in his new apartment. He's playing um, Shadow of Colossus again. He should have been going up against Malice. And then he should have been like, man, fuck this game. This is stupid. Fuck these homing <laughs> shots. This is bullshit. Like, this game was, was great until just, this fucking idiot. I just want to point out, um, when it comes to Malice, get goods. Wow. Oh the C previous episode. You can go to hell. All I'm saying is after I fought him like six or seven times, he was pretty easy. Stupid. You mean after you got muscle memory for his shots and timing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool, bro. <laughs> but, but I will. I said I'll, get good. Is that not getting good? I'm sorry what, I did. Whatever. That's more of a battle of attrition. But I will give you this stroke of your ego. You are a better gamer than most. I'll say that much. I'm I'm really not. I, I can't even take that in good conscience. I'm pretty fucking bad at games. But that's also kind of my point. Like, it's just a matter of understanding the physics of the game instead of trying to brute force through it. Anyway, <laughs> I just want to say that this movie, to me, is fucking incredible. I love this movie. It, in fairness, kind of emotionally destroyed me in a couple of parts. <laughs> I legitimately wasn't ready for the the raw emotions that I was that I felt while watching some of the scenes. I think Adam Sandler certainly deserves more kudos than he gets. I think Definitely. He did, he put on a incredible performance in this movie. And um there's some scenes in here that are frankly just really hard to watch, you know, watching him attempt to commit suicide by cop because he he misplaced his bullets i mean shit that entire sequence where you have to watch him go home pull out his gun look through all the boxes for bullets not look then, just rummage is more of a word like a better description like he literally was like pulling shit aside tossing shit like i need to find these bullets and then to come up with another idea like that, he was wholly dedicated to just end it mm-hmm. that night. Yeah, and that was the first time that he had purchased and consumed alcohol in seemingly a long time. Mm-hmm. Like he was like, absolutely, you know, distraught, destroyed. Mm-hmm. All because he had to just talk about and remember 
verbally losing his family, which I get, but that's how that's how painful it was to him, and that's why that's such such a powerful scene. And and like he says, you know, he he finally confronts his in laws, and you know he essentially says to them, like, I get that you want this because you want to reconcile, you want this kind of closure, you want this, that, and the other, but you don't have to see them everywhere you go, everywhere you turn in the face of everybody on the street. You don't have to look at the, the big fucking great Dane over there and see your stupid little poodle who you lost. Like the amount of torture that this man goes through on a daily basis to have to dredge that back up in such a direct and visceral way would be unbelievably painful. And I I think Adam Sandler does a really great job the whole way through to convey that to you. Um, I certainly understand where Jordan was coming from in a couple of points that without the full breadth of information around uh, what he's going through and all of this, that he comes off as somebody who's, you know, mentally challenged or something to that effect. I can understand how that would creep in, but I think, especially now watching it again with the foreknowledge of everything in the movie, I don't really see it that way. It just it's just another symptom of that post traumatic stress disorder that's rearing its ugly head in everything that he does in every minute of his life. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what else I can say, except that I, I find this movie to be uh, really underrated and moving. I'll agree definitely with the underrated part. I was surprised when I saw some of the ratings on like uh, Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes, I think it deserves a little bit more than what it's given. Um, I'll definitely back that statement. With all that being said, gentlemen, what rating would you give to Reign Over Me? I'm going to go ahead and give this a... I'm going to give it a... 14 out of 16 Colossus. Mm, Colossi, mm, mm. I'm going to give it five out of, oh, hell no. You better not talk to me like that. You better not bring that up to me out of five. I'm going to give this movie one resounding, I'm not crying, you're crying. As always, before we go, remember that you can catch the show live every week on Twitch an entire week before it goes live on all of the feeds, as well as submit your questions and comments for us to read live on the show. If you're listening to this after the fact, follow us and leave a review on your service of choice. And don't forget that you can chat with us anytime over in our Discord server. You can find all the relevant links below. And as always, have fun out there, guys.